Welcome back class. This video will be dedicated solely to one topic and that's beats. Different spelling of course from Bears, Beats, Battlestar Galactica. And I'd like to start with of course the most obnoxious possible example I could find of this phenomenon of interference called beats, specifically beats for sound waves. So here's a guy who's going to show you a bit about tuning bagpipes. And he'll be playing two tones, which, uh, well, yeah, two musical tones, which should contain two identical frequencies. But if the, if the two tones are slightly out of tune, you hear this oscillating intensity in the sound that sounds like wah, wah, wah. That's what you hear if they're slightly out of tune. If they're really out of tune, you, you hear something more like a wah, 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 wah. So listen carefully and see if you can detect the undulating volume of the sound. And all of this will be explained in a moment. You might want to turn your, your volume down or just off completely if you can't stand the sound of a bagpipe. So now I'm going to show you basic tuning of the drones. Um, you'll see me reaching up here and moving these things up and down and then checking the pitch against the low A on the chanter. <laughs> It does take some practice to be able to pick up on that undulation in the volume. So if you didn't hear it, don't feel bad. Let's see if we can explain what's going on using just a little bit of math, including these progressive waves that we've been using for the past couple weeks. You've seen this picture before. Uh, when I presented one dimensional interference, we used this example of two speakers producing uh, two tones of equal frequency. And if you look here, you can see that these frequencies are not the same. They're both sound waves moving through the same air, so the speed is the same. If the speed is the same, then a different wavelength implies two different frequencies. So now we're combining waves of different frequencies. That's something we have not done yet. And to keep the math simple, we'll start by assuming that the speakers produce waves of equal amplitude, and you'll notice that now the wave number K has a subscript to distinguish the two speakers because if the wavelength is different, then so too is the wave number. Wave number is basically the reciprocal of wavelength. And as I just mentioned, the frequencies in time are also different. They even have a different phase constant. You can see here, this looks more like a sine function. This looks more like a cosine function. So they're shifted uh, with different inherent, uh, or I should just say different phase constants. If you took the difference between their phase constants, that's what you would call the inherent phase difference. And the end result here that we're working towards doesn't really matter, or it doesn't really depend on the fact that the amplitudes are the same or that the speakers are in the same place. That undulation in the volume that, that you heard with the bagpipes, you're going to hear that no matter where you put your ear, uh, no matter what the relative position of the speakers is. So let's make some simplifying assumptions that will make the math way easier. Starting with putting them at the same place. Then we can use just one coordinate to describe the displacement at a particular point. There's no need to distinguish x1 from x2 because those numbers would be equal. You can see that here. Instead of x1, I just have x. Same thing down here. And now Let's evaluate the sound intensity at a fixed position, specifically at the origin. Let's ask what the total wave sounds like at the origin. And you can probably tell, whatever the answer is, it would still be true over here or over here. 
the, the phenomenon you hear, or the, the interference phenomenon called beats, is going to happen anywhere. It's not specific to the point right in front of the speakers, but we're choosing that point because it's so much easier math-wise. And do you see why? If you plug in x equals zero for your coordinate, then that term just goes away. So the argument of these two functions just got a lot simpler. And also you'll notice that I'm evaluating each displacement specifically at x equals zero. What else can we do here? Here's a device used by your book. Again, the result that we're going to derive does not depend on any particular phase constant for the two waves. It doesn't even matter what the phase difference is. But let's go with the phase difference of zero, excuse me, an inherent phase difference of zero, because I'm choosing both phase constants to be pi. Ooh, and that means I have to fix this picture. Hang on a second. Okay, that's better. Now you can see that it's like I've shifted each of these sine waves by pi radians. Since each wave has the same phase constant, pi, the inherent phase difference, which would be phi 1, 0 minus phi 2, 0, is 0. So you could say that they're in phase in time, but that's really only at this instant. They have different frequencies, which means if they start out in phase in time, they will end up out of phase in time, which is really what beats are all about. You'll see that in a moment. So this is a snapshot graph, and at this moment, they happen to be in phase in time. Okay, well, the reason your book chooses to do this is because it makes the math even simpler. So I will remind you about this trig uh, identity. The sine of 180 degrees minus theta is the same as just the sine of theta. Great picture here. So what if theta was 30 degrees, for instance? The sine of 30 degrees would be the same as the sine of 150 degrees. You can see that by using the so-called reference triangle. For 30 degrees, you know, you do opposite over hypotenuse. For 150 degrees, the reference triangle is this triangle here, and the angle here would be 30. So when you go to use opposite over hypotenuse, you get the same ratio. So if that's the case, here we have sine of pi minus omega t. That would just be the same as uh, sine of omega t. That way we've gotten rid of the minus sign. That's the whole reason for doing that. Again, the physical result does not depend on this particular choice of phase constants for wave one and wave two. Well, we're interested in the total displacement right in front of the speakers. So it's just like what we did for interference in one dimension where we had two waves of equal frequency traveling in the same direction, and we looked at the interference between them. We're doing the same thing here, but now we're adding two waves of uh, admittedly different frequencies. Omega 1 and omega 2 are, are not necessarily the same anymore. So how do we do this? Well, of course we're going to need a trig identity, and it happens to be one that you've already seen. So you thought you were done this with this particular formula? Not quite yet. Same formula, we're using it for a different purpose. Previously we used it to find the amplitude of the total wave when you superpose two waves of equal frequency, amplitude, wavelength. This time, different frequencies. But notice how our starting point is actually simpler because the last time we did this, we had the full kx minus omega t plus phi in the argument. Now we've gotten rid of that stuff. Okay, so this time I'll let you make the identification. The letter A here will be omega 1t. The letter B will be omega 2t. This A has nothing to do with this A. This A is the amplitude of each individual wave. And I find this. Straight up ap application of the trig identity. Here's my factor of 2 out front. I've got an extra amplitude factor because we had that out front as well. I've got the sum of the two arguments. This argument plus th this argument. The sum goes inside the sine function right here. And the difference goes inside the cosine function and I've just switched the order here to be consistent with what you see in your book. And if you're wondering, wait a minute, is it omega 1t minus omega 2t or omega 2t minus omega 1t? It doesn't matter because cosine is an even function. Here I've factored out t. So this is the same as this. I just chose to factor out the t and put it on the right side. 
Same thing over here, factor out time. And that allows us to identify some new quantities. Let's choose to call this, the difference in the frequencies divided by two, let's call that omega mod. And that name mod comes from the word moduli. You'll see why in just a moment. And I really should have put absolute values here because a frequency always needs to be a positive number. And if in a particular example, your second frequency was higher, then this would come out negative. So I really should have the absolute value symbol. That's what omega mod is. It's the absolute value of the difference divided by two. And this of course is the average. Add two numbers up, divide by two. That's their arithmetic mean. So let's use these, these new definitions to rewrite this a little more succinctly. And see what I just did there before I had all this garbage. Let's call that omega mod. And in the sine function, I can replace that with average omega. And we've already done most of the math. So this really wasn't that bad. What is this formula telling us? Well, which of these frequencies tends to be higher? One of them is a difference. So if the two frequencies are already close together, then when you take their difference, you get a number close to zero. You know, let's say the frequencies are 100 radians per second and 99 radians per second. Their difference would be one. So this would just be one half. But 100 plus 99, well, that's close to 200. 200 divided by two is 100. So one half versus 100, clearly this is the much larger frequency. When your two waves are already close in frequency, sorry, these aren't the two waves. I'm talking about omega one and omega two. When those two waves coming from the speakers are producing tones which are close in frequency, then the average angular frequency is much greater in value than this so-called omega mod. So what would happen, uh, how would the, the displacement of the air particles change in time without this factor out front? If you just ignore this cosine out front, then the air particles would be jiggling back and forth sinusoidally with this frequency omega average. So that's a frequency halfway between the two original frequencies. And that's what you see with the blue curve here. This wiggling in time, notice we're being shown the displacement in time. It's, it's uh, wiggling back and forth at a high frequency called omega average. Not necessarily high, but in this picture it looks high because the wavelength is short. On top of that sinusoidal oscillation, we've superimposed this so-called modulating factor or modulating function. So what does the cosine function do? What, what's the range of values of the cosine function? Cosine oscillates between one and negative one. So as time advances, so you've parked yourself in front of the speakers and you're watching how the displacement of the uh, air particles depends on time. Well, as time goes on, this factor out front slowly oscillates between one and negative one. I say slowly because I just established that omega mod is a much l lower number than omega average. So all you're doing is modulating the amplitude of the sine function. Without this factor out front, this sine function would go between one, negative one, one, negative one. You see that with the blue curve. It's bouncing back and forth between one and negative one. But on top of that, we're changing the amplitude as well. So the amplitude um, doesn't stay equal to one. Right here, the amplitude is one. So the, the particles are being uh, shaken back and forth between a value of one and negative one, but slowly their amplitude decreases due to this modulating factor out front. And this is often called the envelope function. It's shown in a dashed line. Now, What's a little confusing is the fact that cosine can be uh, anywhere between one and negative one. So if the amplitude were negative one, then this function is still oscillating between one and negative one. It's like, um, yeah, I mean, if, if you had a bunch of particle positions between one and negative one, and then you multiplied them all by another factor of negative one, that would just flip them across the uh, the t-axis, but the, the width here would be the same. Okay, so the, the amplitude is being modulated. You've all heard of AM radio. Some of you might like to listen to AM radio. 
if you're in the mood for uh, talk and not music, AM stands for amplitude modulation. So that radio wave is being modulated much like you see here. What's the maximum amplitude and time? That would be 2A. And the minimum amplitude you can see right here is zero. Points in time at which the cosine function takes on this, uh, the value zero, that's when your total oscillations have an amplitude of zero. So this picture right here already explains what you were hearing with the bagpipes. He was producing two tones which were close together in frequency, and there were moments in time when the total amplitude was high, that's when the, the sound was louder, and then there are moments where the, uh, the amplitude is close to zero, and that's when the sound is lower. Now, really, in that bagpipe, bagpipe example, there were never any moments where the sound was close to zero. It was always loud. You just heard it getting louder, softer, louder, softer. So this is a perfect example where the two tones have equal amplitude. If the two tones have equal amplitude, it's possible to get that perfect destructive interference. Uh, but with the bagpipes, I'm sure they did not have equal amplitudes. That's why we didn't hear perfect destructive interference. Okay, so these moments in time, that's when the two waves are interfering constructively. And a moment like this in time is when those two waves are interfering destructively. They're out of phase. Maximum amplitude 2A. And again, this is the, the so-called envelope function. Whee! And the frequency of the, the jiggling within the envelope, that blue curve, that's the, the much higher frequency omega average. Okay, what do we have going on here? Well, what if we'd like to describe the uh, average frequency using hertz and not radians per second? You remember, to convert from angular frequency to regular old frequency, you just divide by 2 pi, right? For every cycle of oscillation, there are 2 pi radians. So anything that's uh, periodic in time is going through more radians per second than it is cycles per second. And that's why the frequency in hertz is always a lower number than the angular frequency in radians per second. Okay, so all I've done is taken the, ex uh, the definition of omega average and divided it by 2 pi. And let's do this. Let's distribute the 2 pi to both terms. Division is distributive, but omega 1 over 2 pi is what we call F1. That's the frequency coming out of speaker 1 in hertz. So I've rewritten this in terms of the, uh, the individual speaker frequencies in hertz, not radians per second. And of course, this is just the average of the frequencies in hertz. That's why we called it F average. Okay, so that's worth knowing. If you have two sources of sound or light and they're, they're superposing and the frequencies, well, they really don't have to be close together, but most of the time when we're talking about beats, we're talking about frequencies which are close to each other. The average frequency that you would hear if we're talking about uh, musical tones would just be the arithmetic mean. It's the frequency right in the middle. Now, if you had two violins playing the same note, one of them was 400 hertz and one of them was 399, then the average would be 399.5, which is really close to both numbers. So your ear perceives basically the same pitch that it would perceive if you heard either violin playing individually. Strictly speaking, omega mod is the frequency of the envelope function. So let me trace out one wavelength in, I, I'm sorry, not one wavelength. It's really one period in time for the modulating frequency. That's this period right here. That's one full period. However, because your ear really just detects the absolute value of the oscillations and your ear doesn't care whether the um, air particles air particles are going down this way or up this way it's it's perceived as the same amplitude of sound then really the the period of the beats is half that so it, i'm going to make that silly noise again when you hear uh, the beats with the bagpipes you hear that wah 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 sound every wah is one of these humps this would be wah, wah. 
So you actually get two beats per period of the modulating frequency. So if the, if the period of the beats is one half the period of the modulating frequency, then we can use this relation to conclude that the frequency of the beats is double the frequency of modulation. So in time, this is how long it takes uh, to be modulated once. The, the quick wiggling in time, the omega average, that gets modulated once every time we do this in time. And every time that happens, you've actually gone through two beats, okay? Beat frequency is double the modulation frequency that we defined. But what was the modulation frequency? In radians per second, it's this. You take the difference between the two angular frequencies and divide by two. In order to convert that into a, a frequency in hertz, we have to divide by two pi. So just divide this by two pi. That's how I got this formula. And then just like before, division is distributive. I will divide two pi into both of those angular frequencies to convert them into frequencies in hertz. And don't forget that the beat frequency, the number of beats you hear per second, the number of wah, 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 that's double this formula. So the two goes away. Oh, you can see what I did here. I switched over to absolute values, which I should have done in the very beginning. It doesn't matter which frequency is higher. You're just interested in the absolute value. Frequencies are positive numbers. Okay, so now we multiply by two to convert F mod into F beat. And there it is. What a simple result. The beat frequency you can expect to hear when you superpose two waves of slightly different frequency is merely the difference between the frequencies, the absolute value of the difference. Now I say, I say superpose two frequencies which are close together because we'll see when we take a look at Desmos that if the frequencies are very far apart, you really don't get this beat phenomenon. It's not very pronounced. You only experience beats when the frequencies are close together. Easy numerical example, if you were superposing two electromagnetic waves of frequencies 700 and 705 hertz, that's actually a bad example because that's a really low frequency for e &M waves. Let's go with the sound waves, 700 and 705. Well, a lot of people would be able to tell the difference between these tones. They would be able to tell that this one has a slightly higher pitch. When you sound the two tones simultaneously, what what your brain perceives or your ear perceives is a single tone uh, which is jiggling at 702.5. I just took the average between those. So what you think you hear is a pitch in the middle of these two, but it's getting louder, softer, louder, softer um, five times per second because you get alternating constructive and destructive interference in time. Hopefully this graphic makes it a little easier to understand. You can see both of the original waves <coughs> on top of each other. And what you get as a result is this. So if these two frequencies are 700 and 705, then the frequency you see inside the envelope here is 702.5, but it's getting uh, larger in amplitude, smaller in amplitude, larger in amplitude, smaller in amplitude. That corresponds to louder, smaller, Loud, excuse me, louder, softer, louder, softer in time. And it's doing that five times per second. I got the number five just by taking the difference between the two frequencies. Really easy math, right? Took a little bit of trig to get the, the end result. But the end result is super simple. Let's see if Desmos can handle the task of animating uh, beats, the, the phenomenon of beats. The pictures that you just saw only showed you... Uh, did I call it a snapshot graph? I guess the picture with the two speakers and the, the waves coming out, that was a snapshot graph. But the other graphs I showed you were really um, history graphs. It was a history graph of the oscillation right in front of the speakers. So how, how that oscillation depends on time. Let's see if Desmos can show us both, right? Because it takes some imagination to combine the snapshot graph with the history graph. By animating it, we can see everything. Okay, so let's put in a couple waves of different frequency. I'll have an unspecified amplitude A times the sine of 
what is it, KX? K is the wave number. Well, I'm asking you to do this uh, in your head right now because I don't have a whiteboard, but do you remember that omega over K is the wave speed V? So I can actually write K as omega divided by speed. I'm using the letter W for omega because Desmos is not offering Greek characters here. W, o, excuse me, omega over V. That really is the wave number K times X minus omega, in other words, W times T. So there's several parameters here. I have the option of specifying the amplitude, specifying the angular frequency, specifying the wave speed, and specifying the moment in time. And this is the one that I'm going to let play uh, as a, an animation. T will, will just take on increasing values. And how about we, we make all of those parameters? Okay, you've seen this before, but I can increase the amplitude of the wave. If I change omega or T, all that's going to do is scoot the graph right or left. And if I change the speed, yeah, that's a little misleading. I don't want to confuse you. So let's go straight to the second wave. I'll give it the same amplitude. Okay, and this time, the uh, we're allowing the frequency to be different. Now, I'd like to call it omega plus delta omega, which is like the other frequency plus a little change. But then, uh, well, I can't do that in Desmos because if I tried typing something like del, it thinks that's two different parameters. I guess it's assuming the letter E is uh, the exponential, the base of the exponential function. Okay. So what I have to do instead is call it omega plus D. So I'm using the letter D for delta. This new frequency is the old frequency or the frequency of the first wave, omega, plus a little change, okay? W plus D really means omega plus delta. That's the frequency of the second wave. So I really have um, omega over speed where this is the new omega. In other words, this whole thing is the second wave number. You could call it K2 if you want, minus omega T. And I'll make D a parameter as well. Cool, so we can see that we've got two waves of different frequency. And if I adjust the value of D, then I'm changing the difference between the two frequencies. This is omega one, I'll call it, and up here is omega two. Let's go with smaller increments. Can I do that? Let's let D go from 0 0.1 all the way to 1 in steps of 0 0.1. I want uh, the difference in the frequencies to be small because by assumption, we're talking about two frequencies which are close together. Okay, so if I set the difference D to 0.1, then you can see that these waves are in fact close together in frequency. So let me zoom out. Zoom out. And you can see that at some points in time, this is a snapshot graph, by the way, because we're really plotting the displacement versus X versus position. That's what Desmos does. It assumes that your X coordinate is the horizontal coordinate on the graph. So we're looking at a graph uh, uh, that your book calls a snapshot graph. Time is not increasing. That's what I'm going to do later with the animation function down here. So at this point in time, this snapshot graph, the waves are mostly interfering constructively here. See how their peaks are aligned? They're aligned here. But if we zoom out, we can see that farther away, we're getting <coughs> maximum destructive interference. So there are places where the interference is constructive, places where it's destructive. And then once we animate in time, those uh, positions are going to change places. Okay, so now what I'll do, instead of graphing the two waves individually, what just happened there? I don't know how to fix this. Hang on a second. Okay, let me take the second wave and add it now to the first wave. So this is their superposition. Previously, I called it D1 and D2. This is D1 plus D2. All right, and you can immediately see this beat 
phenomenon. So the wiggling that you're looking at, that's the frequency omega average, which would be halfway between omega-1 and omega-2. And then you can clearly see the envelope function, which oscillates at a frequency omega mod. So let me trace out one oscillation in time for omega mod. That would be that. One full period for omega mod. And of course, the beat frequency is double that. Every time the amplitude increases like this, your ear would per perceive a louder sound. Can we increase the amplitude of each individually? Make this easier to see? Yes. And let me do something else. Uh, the frequency of <coughs> one of the waves is 1 down here. Remember, W really means omega. And the difference is 0.1. So the, the difference compared to each individual frequency is about 1 tenth. If two frequencies really are close together, then the difference in the two frequencies is, is l way less compared to the frequencies. Like I gave the example of 100 hertz and 99 hertz. Let's make the frequency bigger. So I'm gonna go up to 10 instead. And this is probably a better example. You can see just how much higher the modulation frequency is than the envelope frequency. I'm sorry, I said that backwards. How much higher the average frequency? This is omega average inside. The blue oscillations are omega average. And then the envelope is the modulation frequency. Okay, so every one of these peaks is the, you know, the wah, wah, wah. This is so silly, but I'll just go ahead and do it. Wah, 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 wah. I think you get the picture. What happens if I slightly increase the difference delta in the two frequencies. Hmm. Does this make sense with our formulas? Well, according to our formulas, the beat frequency is the absolute value of the difference of the two frequencies in hertz. So the greater the difference is, the more beats you hear per second. Wah, 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 wah. You're going to hear that if the frequencies are more different. And if they're really close together, you would hear wah, wah. So we're seeing that here. As I increase the distance, excuse me, the difference, I'm using the letter D for delta. That's the difference in the two frequencies. The higher I make that, uh, the more oscillations there are per time, the more beats per time. And this is why I pointed out that you only really experience beats when the, the two frequencies are close together. If they're, if they're very different, you know, look at this. Uh, one frequency is 10, the other one would be 10.7 because I chose 0.7 as my delta. Even for a difference of 0.7, uh, you get so many wah, 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 wah per second. At, you get to a point where you don't even really perceive the undulation in the volume. It almost sounds like a totally different tone. So that perceived undulation or oscillation in the volume really only happens if the beat frequency is relatively low. Even a beat frequency of like 10, like if you had two notes, um, 400 hertz and 410 hertz, the beat frequency would be 10. I don't think you can really detect 10 beats per second. You're not even going to perceive that as oscillating sound volume. But let's take advantage of the full capability of Desmos here. I'll go back to a small difference in the frequencies. And let's set this whole thing in motion. You can uh, change it so that time only advances forward, I just discovered, or learned. Thank you, Miles. Okay, I have to admit, I'm a little confused by this. I thought the whole thing should be moving to the right. I think it's not because I have such a low speed. So let me go with a, a greater speed. Whoa. and then put this thing in motion. Hmm. Also not what I expected. Let me sort this out. Okay, I figured out what I was doing wrong, and some of you probably caught this. I forgot to update the frequency in the second wave. The new omega, which is omega plus d. If, if omega is the angular frequency for the first wave, and D is the difference between the two frequencies, then the frequency for the second wave is omega plus D. 
I need to have that in the expression for the wave number, and I also have to have it as my new frequency. So I forgot this plus D here, and now you can see that the whole thing is moving to the right. So if the speakers were located at the origin, and you were sitting right there, your ear is located at the origin, and you're listening to how the sound intensity changes with time, it's very clear that you're going to experience beats. Every time one of these, um, they look like, I don't know, what's this shape? When, every time one of these pods goes by you, you experience one beat. Should I do it one more time? Add the sound effects? Okay, here I go. Here's an example of a practical usage of beats. We talked in a previous presentation about how the double Doppler shift is used in radar. So the radar antenna emits an electromagnetic wave at a particular frequency. You put yourself in the frame of reference of the plane. You find that the wave is shifted to a higher frequency. The plane will reflect or the aircraft will reflect that same frequency. Then you put yourself back in the reference frame of the antenna and you see yet another Doppler shift because from the antenna's perspective, it's the aircraft that's approaching. So you use that double Doppler shift that I already talked about. And that means that the received frequency, the reflected frequency picked up by the antenna is going to be different from the emitted frequency. So here's the outgoing wave. After it bounces off the aircraft in the antenna's frame of reference, it gets reflected at a shorter wavelength, also known as a higher frequency. And really, those two things are happening simultaneously. The antenna is putting out a steady wave at a frequency which I, I will call F emitted. That's the same as what I called F sub zero previously. And it's simultaneously receiving the reflected frequency, which I'm calling F received. And we've now established that those two waves will interfere and produce beats. This time it's electromagnetic beats, so you're not going to stand there and hear it, but you could detect the beat frequency using electronics. And as I understand it, that's how radar works. That's how police radar guns work. The electronics within the gun is detecting the beat frequency between the emitted radio wave and the received radio wave. This is the beat frequency that the electronics would need to detect. So the hard part is done now. Let's take a look at some cool examples. The first one comes from this YouTube channel. This channel has some of the most amazing demos I found anywhere on the web for physics. Each of the uh, demo apparatus is like an antique. I mean, it's really, it's like a work of art, every single one of these videos. I am not going to attempt to pronounce the name of this channel. It's Italian. I'll just call it Florence FST. Highly recommend checking out that channel.
This guy's name is James Lincoln. He's a local guy. The caption here says UCLA, but at least recently he was teaching at a community college down in Orange County, I believe. Here are two identical tuning forks, both marked 288 hertz D. If I sound them together and you listen, you can hear that they're making the same note. They're in agreement. But what if I put one in ice and the other in a flame? I'll tell you in a minute. These two tuning forks are not in agreement. This one has a little extra mass so that it lowers the frequency slightly. Now if I sound them together, you'll hear them interfering. You can see the effect on an oscilloscope. Now that the forks are ready, let's have a listen. First to the cold, and then to the hot. And then together. Can you hear the interference? When two frequencies are very close together, they add rhythmically, both constructively and destructively. The result is called beats. Beats, a rhythmic interference of close frequencies. Quiet, loud, quiet, loud. Well, well, well. My stupid noises were better. Okay, here's yet another teacher who makes me look bad. You can see the waveform for one beat has the same shape as the black wave, which is the superposition of the two waves close to one another in frequency. Again, because both waveforms show beat frequency. The top wave is the audio recording of beats, and the bottom wave is an ideal representation. A practical application of this is that beats are a useful way to tune some musical instruments. For example, on a guitar, the fourth harmonic of the low E string is at the same frequency as the third harmonic of the A string. So this is the E string, and this is the first harmonic on the E string. This is the second harmonic on the low E string. And just so you know, I am holding my finger gently on the string and not pushing down to create a node at this point and to force harm a harmonic at this point. So this is the second harmonic, the third harmonic, and the fourth harmonic on the low E string. And this is the A string, so this is the first harmonic on the A string. This is the second harmonic on the A string, and the third harmonic on the A string. Therefore, when you play the fourth harmonic on the low E string and the third harmonic on the A string, you should not hear any beats because the two are in tune with one another. However, if one of the strings is slightly out of tune, then what you hear is beats. And what you can do is you can then adjust the frequency so you no longer hear beats and the two are in tune with one another. One more time. So again, if one of the strings is slightly out of tune with the other one, you hear beats, and what you can do is adjust the frequency so you no longer hear beats and the two are in tune with one another. The last example I have for you is something you may have wondered about. Have you ever been sitting in a car at a stoplight and you're maybe you're getting ready to turn left so your blinker's on, at least it had better be on, and you're totally zoned out staring at the car in front of you and you start to notice that their blinker is in sync with your yours. They're blinking together. And then, wait a minute, a few seconds later, they're not blinking together. And it's kind of annoying. Like, why were you blinking together and now you're not? Well, as it turns out, the answer is pretty simple and it has a lot to do with the way music works, believe it or not. As I'm sure you noticed, at some point, blinkers do occasionally sync between two different cars while waiting at a traffic light, but just for a short amount of time, after which they start to 
drift away again. Ok, so most of the cars on the road use incandescent light bulbs for their turn signals, and the blinking is controlled by a relay and a resistor capacitor circuit, which is driven by electrical current. And it's that resistor capacitor circuit that can cause this huge headache while sitting at a traffic light. Both the resistors and capacitors used in the circuit have certain manufacturing tolerances and they're never perfect or identical. In other words, two circuits coming from the same factory at roughly the same time can offer different results when fitted onto a car. But even if the electronics were 100% the same between two cars, there are still some variables that can mess things up. Stuff like ambient temperature and battery voltage. As a result, each and every resistor capacitor circuit has a different frequency and so each and every car on the road has a different frequency at which its blinkers operate, even if we're talking about two identical models from the same car brand. When the frequencies of two cars meet, they're in phase, and when they start to drift apart, they begin to go out of phase. The rate at which this process cycles is called beat frequency. See, I told you it has something in common with music. Moreover, beat frequency is actually just the difference between two cars' blinking frequencies, so two turn signals with closer together frequencies will take longer to go through the in-phase, out-of-phase cycle, while blinkers that have identical frequencies will never synchronize unless they're started at the exact same time. In theory, if two cars were to have identical turn signal electronics, identical battery voltages, identical ambient temperatures, identical light bulbs, and the people at the steering wheel would put on the blinkers at the exact same time, their blinkers should be synchronized. But in the real world, this probably never happens, so expect to see the same in-phase and out-of-phase blinkers when stopped at traffic lights. Yeah, well, you know what? Nobody cares about your stupid beat farm. Beats are the worst. People love beats. Nobody likes beats. Everyone loves beats. Nobody likes beats, Dwight. Why don't you grow something that everybody does like? You should grow candy. I'd love a piece of candy right now. Not a beat.